Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Trenta with Soleiman Rahim, who's a Senior Director of Engineering. And today we're going to talk about power optimization. You've done a great explanation of how to figure out what's the best use of your time. Now what do you do about it? So now you identify, you know, the block you want to spend time on, uh, because that's, those are the blocks where you can save the most uh, power. On those blocks, you have done more analysis to identify what are the macroarchitecture you have to focus on, uh, what are the signal triggering activity, what are the register you have to focus on, and so on and so far. So when you identify this, the next step is to apply what we call power reduction techniques. And here I have listed a few of them. And the first one is try to do what we call coarse grain power reduction. So coarse grain power reduction is basically what are um, the change I can do uh, to, you know, through one or two changes, achieve shutdown like a block, for example. So this is what we call a coarse grain power reduction. And here we can use what we call the activity trigger detection technique. And the activity trigger te detection technique is basically identifying what are the signal triggering activity in your design. So if I take an example of like a DMA design, right, where you have a CPU, like a memory, a DMA controller and the periphery, um, in that uh, design, what happened is like you, you uh, send uh, basically a request to the DMA and that you want to read and write into memory without going through the CPU. And the DMA sent a request to the CPU asking him to free the, the, the data uh, bus and the address bus. And the CPU acknowledged that. And when it's done, so the CPU has released the address bus and the data bus, the periphery can start reading and writing to the memory. If you look at the activity profile of the design, you can see that, well, you know, under a certain control signal, the DMA starts uh, uh, doing something, and then uh, uh, when he's, he has received the knowledge of the CPU and the periphery has stopped uh, reading and writing the memory, he sends another control signal, and you can see the activity of the DMA is going to uh, back to zero. So basically, under a control 1 and control 2, the DMA is starting having some activity, and under control 2, the DMA is stopping having some activity. So if you have like a, like a technique that identifies those control signals, you can see that for control 1, there is like an event that, that, that makes the DMA go from idle to non-idle. The coverage of that uh, signal is 100%, so meaning that each time that the control signal uh, has um, the control signal goes from 0 to 1, for example, there is an activity on the DMA, and the noise is 0%, so meaning that uh, each time that the, uh, the, the activity of the DMA goes from idle to non-idle, the control signal is going from 0 to 1. Same thing for the, control, the second control signal, and, and you can see that the, ins the power profile of the DMA is such as the dynamic profile is 40 milliwatt, the uh, static power is 0.5 milliwatt, and the clock-in efficiency is 0%. So now, basically, using the control 1 and control 2 signal, you can do coarse grain power reduction by clocking, uh, clock gating the DMA uh, controller here because there is no need for the DMA uh, to, um, to have the clock of the DMA toggle when the DMA is not used. Does it matter what process geometry you're working at or does it apply all the way up from 130 down to uh, the lowest? It's completely independent of the process. Uh, this is uh, mainly like a, func like a f uh, functionality of the design, right? So um, here, under the control 1 and control 2, you decide when to use the DMA and when to not use the DMA. And the problem is that sometimes uh, the designer forget to clock gate the DMA uh, when it's not used, right? And this will basically, uh, this technique will identify those cases, right? So, uh, but the problem is that if you forget about it, it's pretty huge power loss, right? You might actually, uh, you know, consume 30, 40 percent more power that you should, right? So it's very important in those cases to uh, identify those cases and, and perform coarse grain power reduction. Those are usually um, architectural uh, decision, and if somebody forgot uh, to do those kind of clock gating, then again that will create a major power uh, problem, and and this is this is kind of like what uh, is of the problem. Does it, does it matter if it's CMOS or FDSLI or stack die or is it apply all the way across? No, again, this is purely functional. So it's like a functional behavior of your design and um, it apply across the board. 
because if that, that functional behavior is there in your design, then, uh, then you need to identify it and, and resolve it. Uh, because it's, again, functionally, the design is consuming more power you should. Meaning that you can re-implement the same design by removing that functional redundancy and achieve power uh, savings. So how does this actually work with the macro architecture? Yeah. So basically, um, we have, using the activity trigger detection technique, we are, we are able to do coarse grain power detection. Now we can go one uh, level, abs uh, uh, up level of abstraction lower and look at the macro architecture. And here I've listed a few techniques. One is the counter technique. So when you have a counter, uh, which is counting, uh, let's say you have like a 15-bit counter, actually a 16-bit counter, and it's, it's, you are incrementing the previous value by one, you can now slice the counter, right, uh, using the bit seven, and clock gate the higher bit of the counter using the bit seven, because the higher bit of the counter uh, doesn't, the value doesn't change until you don't get, uh, you know, you don't get the count uh, seven, uh, take the value one. So why uh, do we have? Do you need to have the clock toggling where the input value doesn't change? So by using the uh, uh, bit seven of the counter, you can clock get them and make sure that the clock is not toggling where the uh, input value doesn't change. Uh, so this is one technique. The other technique, and that the other technique is look at uh, operators. So here, for example, you have back-to-back -back multiplier, and one input of the multiplier comes from like a combination logic. So that input will be glitchy. And because it's glitchy, you might consume more power than you should. And by identifying this multiplier and this glitchy input, you can try to see if there is a way of uh, registering the input and removing the glitch. So what you can do is look at the find out of the multiplier. Here, for example, there is like a mux, and you can use the input of the mux to come and remove the glitch of that multiplier. Yeah. So, so instead of actually finding out what, when you're running out of battery power, you were able to target all these uh, possible uh, problems at the RTL level, right? Yes, correct. You can identify those problems at the RTL level and fix them before you uh, go to implementation. Okay. So let's take this down to the register and the memory level. What do you actually have to do there? Yeah. So for register, uh, one technique is to uh, use the stability condition of the flop. So basically for a flop, you look at the input cone of the flop and see if there is a condition where the input flop of the flop or the input of the flop doesn't change. So in this case, I can see that in the finding of the, f of the, the, the flop, there is another flop where there is an ICG. So when this enable is zero, the value of this flop doesn't change. And when the value of this flop doesn't change, the value of this flop doesn't change either. So it means that the enable of this flop is a uh, st stability condition for the flop there. So now you can use this flop, uh, disenable, delete by one cycle and create an ICG for uh, the, the flop you want to get. Uh, the observability is the same uh, principle where you look at the fan out of the flop and you see that there is a two back-to-back -back muxes and you can see that for one muxes there is like a previous stage of the select line and you use that previous stage to create a new clock gaining for uh, the register because when this uh, select line of the mux is one, the value at the output of the uh, flop is not observable, and hence you can use the, uh, the select line at previous stage to clock gate the flop. And how about for memory? So for memory, uh, same principle. You look at the memory, you look at the output of the memory, and see if you can find an observability condition. In this case, if I look at the output of the memory, it goes to a mux, and if the input of the mux is selecting one, then the output of the memory is not observable. So if you are doing a read in that case, that read will be redundant. So what you do is you use the select line of the MUX to come and, optim and remove the, that redundant read of that memory. Same thing for the uh, write. So for example, you have the data of the memory, address of the memory. You can see that when the data doesn't change and the address doesn't change, then you can use those conditions to remove the uh, write that you are doing. Because if you are doing a write on the same data and address that write is written or not. Right. So where do vectors fit in all this? Yeah. So vectors are, um, can be very important when you do power reduction. Uh, you have techniques which are uh, less dependent or no, not independent of vectors. For example, if you identify that uh, enable is constant uh, one, then this is something which is independent of the vector because it's a functionally uh, the enable is one. When you look at, um, for example, if you can share clock gating across hierarchy, Again, this technique is independent of the vector. 
But if you look at other techniques like uh, those techniques, the, the stability techniques or um, observability techniques, then these techniques really depend on the vector. Why? Suppose that the enable uh, duty cycle is zero. So let's see EN is zero, right? Then in that case, this is a good candidate to uh, clock gate the flop. Uh, the f let's call this flop F1, FF1. So if the enable is equal, is the cycle is zero, it's a good candidate to clock gate the flop F1. But now if the enable duty cycle is almost one, then that's not a good candidate to clock gate uh, the flop uh, F1. Why? Because this will most of the time take the value one. So the clock gating here take mo most of the time the value one. So it's not doesn't shut down the clock, and then the power that you there is no power saving on the uh, on the flop. And worst case uh, is that this this uh, logic that you have added is actually consuming more power than it saves. And at the end of the day, you are going to increase your power instead of optimi uh, uh, reducing the power. So here again, you know, uh, the vector is very important because depending on the duty cycle of the enable, it can make a big difference on the power saving. Same thing here, uh, if you look at the um, observability, if you look at the in select line of this max, if this uh, select line often select the value one, right, if I call that select, if the select line often choose the value one, then that will be a good uh, candidate because most of the time you make this flop non observable But if the select is most of the time zero and select actually the output of this flop, then that's not a good candidate because most of the time the enable that you will create will take the value uh, one and then will not shut down the clock and because it doesn't shut down the clock your efficient the clock and efficiency will be low and actually the logic that you have added will actually might increase the power instead of reducing the power so the vector are very important for some of the power reduction techniques and they are also very important when you do the profiling right so for example if you have like an end gate right and this end gate goes to an uh, icg of your design right and let's say that you uh, look at the probability of the input right if you don't use uh, vectors right you do a static propagation you probably get 0.5 here right and then 0.5 means that i'm shutting down my clock half of the time right but if you look at the vector the simulation trace of these two input might be something like that, right? So if this is input one, this is input two. So, so now, if I look at the vector and I look at the simulation, the output of this end gate is zero, right? Now, so from the simulation, I can see that the output of my end gate of zero. So before my clock gain efficiency was 50%, but now it's 0%, which is the correct value. Actually, sorry, it's 100%. So previously, because I was not using vector, I would say, well, this 50% uh, clock gain efficiency, I'm gonna go and maybe try to optimize this flop. But now because I have used the vector and see, saw the, the trace of the input one and input two, I have derived that actually the uh, plug-in efficient 100%, so this flop is already optimized for power, so I should not go and spend any time on that. Soliman Rahim, thank you very much for a great explanation of power optimization. You're welcome, man. Thank you.